Well, Paul wrote these words from prison. And prison is not a very good thing because you, you are not free to go where you want to go. You are not free to, go, to do what you want to do. And so obviously it must have been stressful. It can be stressful for anybody. But he was writing, or he sat to write down this book, or this letter, to Timothy. The one who needed encouragement is the one who was now giving out the encouragement. The one who was in prison and needed somebody to come and write words of comfort, words that would bring peace in his heart, is the one who is now writing to this young man, Timothy, to encourage him. Because, you see, he knew that time would come when Timothy would face challenges. You know, sometimes we get this gospel where an evangelist will say, come to Jesus and everything will be all right. But you and I know that that's a lie. Because problems do come. And we say, Jesus is the answer. Sometimes we ask, what was the question? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have tribulations. So he didn't just, he didn't tell us, well, once you come to me, there will be no suffering. But you see, what he assured us was that there will be peace inside because he would be with us even when we go through those challenges. And as we sit here, some of us are just coming out of a storm. And some of us are in the midst of a storm. And praise God, some of us are heading towards one. Because it's the storms of life that build us up, that builds our character. Storms of life, they are the ones that test us. They are the ones that show us our ability to stand firm in the Lord Jesus Christ and just to trust him and to believe in him. Sometimes the storms, they come in so strong that they shake our very foundation. And if we are not strong, if we don't know that these situations will arise in our lives, we'll fall by the wayside. And so it was important for Paul to, to remind this young disciple, this young preacher, that he needed to be ready for those kinds of things, for the challenges of life. He needed to be ready because it will not be all rosy. Even with even roses, I've, I've come to realize they've got some thistles, you know, thorns. Even roses. And so life will be like that. It was important for Paul to remind him that whenever you go through these things, remember your calling. Remember what has been imparted into your life by the laying on of hands. Remember when you go through these things that you have been called. Never forget. And the message that young Timothy was to get is that for God has not given us a spirit of fear. He has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And because when you remember that, it doesn't matter what you go through. He was calling on Timothy to hold fast to his calling. And in verse 12, which is our main scripture this morning, for this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, 
I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep what I've committed to him until that day, or the King James Version says again, it's that day. And so I want to speak to us this morning on the message I've entitled, I know whom I have believed. I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him until that day. When storms come in your life, and they will do as I've said, you need to know whom you have believed. Because if your foundation is weak, everything will crumble. Because sometimes we say, why am I going through this? It means God doesn't love me. I'm finished. I'm through with him. Why is he allowing these things to happen in my life? But we should be able to say, when these things come in our lives, we should be able to, to say like the songwriter, we have an anchor that steals the storm. Steadfast and sure while the billows roar. Fastened to the rock which cannot be moved. Grounded, firm, and deep in the Savior's love. We have an anchor. That's why Jesus prayed in, chapter, in John chapter 17 and verse 3. It says, this is life eternal, that they may know the only God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Because Jesus saw it I mean, he knew it was very important and so it necessary that the disciples understand, that the disciples believe, that the disciples know him who has sent him. This is life eternal, that they may know the only God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And Daniel says in chapter 11, verse 32, he says, They that know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. The King James says, which some of us in the old generation love, and do exploits. No wonder Paul prayed in Philippians chapter 3, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. So to say, I know whom I believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day, is to make a decision to walk closely with God. To stand firm in his truth and to take action towards the goals that God has called you to do. And you can only do that when that, that, that des, uh, restless desire to have a deeper relationship with God is in your heart, is in your life. You know, there was a time, I think I was getting a bit bored with the Christian life. Because it seems there, was, there wasn't much in it. And I remember it was in 1996 when I began to be restless. I wanted to know God. I, wanted, I was a Christian, but I wanted to know truly, who, deeply, who this God was. And I couldn't help but relate with Moses when God was asking to go and rescue the children of Israel out of Egypt. And he says, when I go to, to them and tell them, that the God of your fathers has asked me to, to get you out of here. And they ask me, what is his name? 
What will I tell them? Because you see, he, he wanted to make sure that he understood who God is. And I began to find out what he was, who he is, who he was, and how that would transform me. And it did transform me. Because then I, 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 I began to go deeper into relationship with him. Because you can only be strong and stand firm if you know who he really is. And so I began to have this thirst to have the knowledge of who God is. Started to ask a lot of questions. And you will recall from the scripture that God answered Moses and said, go and tell them, I am who I am. That's a very strange name. I am who I am. And so I started to look at the revelation of God as he revealed himself to man, as he, as he exposed himself to man. And then I began to know whom I had believed. First of all, I began to understand that this God that I was serving was a great God. For in Genesis chapter 1, or the Bible say, it starts with the words, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, Elohim. In the beginning, El. In the beginning, the great God. The one who had creative power. The one for whom nothing was impossible. The one who could say and make something out of nothing. This is the God I was serving. A God of might. This is the God I was serving. The God who would even give names to insects and animals. If he called an insect a mosquito, nobody would call it a crocodile. He was God. And he was in charge. He was there in the beginning. For before him, there was nobody. He was from the beginning. And he created everything. This is the God I was serving. This is the God that I had believed in. Man, that gave me, I mean, I could walk with the chest up. Because I knew I was serving a great God. You need to know God. You need to know his greatness. You need to know his power. Because if you do that, then nothing will shake you. Because there's nothing that is too hard for God to do. He is Elohim. Now we don't have the time to go through all these names. That takes a long time. That would be a series. But I just wanted you to have just a, a bit of a test of who God is. <laughs> Before anything was, there was God. But you see, I began also to understand that he was not just a God of power, a powerful and a great God. I began to understand that this God, his name is Jehovah. We've just been singing about him this morning. That he's not just, he's not just a, a great and powerful God who is good out there, who can, who can uh, 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 create everything and, uh, and sustain the world. And I mean, he sits in glory and in his beauty up there, but he has no relationship with me. But in Jehovah, I began to understand that I, was, I had believed in a covenant-keeping God. I had believed in the sovereign God. I had believed in God with moral attributes. 
I had believed in God who could have a relationship with a sinner, with a man like myself. I had believed the greater I am. What else would give me confidence? I believe. I know. I know whom I have believed. His name is Elohim. I know whom I have believed. His name is Jehovah. I know whom I have believed. I began to understand that his name is El Shaddai. And love, I love it here because now we have compound names of God. He was not just El, who I've already told you is the same like Elohim. He was not just a God of power, but he was a God who was more than enough for you and I. Now I know that there have been schools of thought and, and scholars have debated on what Shaddai means and uh, uh, the major schools of thought. Some believe that it comes from the root of the breast, meaning it's the source. He is the source of all life. Some have believed it's a mountain. It is a god of the mountain. But even then, that mountain is the source of life. And so what I need to know, and it is enough for me to understand, that this God is not just great, but this God is able to supply my needs. He's able to supply my needs. He's more than enough for me. And so who, why should I worry? Why should I carry all these burdens? Why should I, I, I be anxious about what I need for today, what I need for tomorrow? I serve a God who is great and who is great and mighty to supply, to nourish, and to satisfy. He is mighty in El, and he supplies in Shaddai, he nourishes in Shaddai and is satisfied. And he's a God who is able to cause nature to do things that are opposite to their rules. Because he's God. I mean, in the story where this name is revealed, we find it's, it has to do with Abraham, Sarah, having no children, God had promised him an inheritance, or had promised him uh, this inheritance, and he says, but how can I, uh, uh, I have no son. And uh, we know the story how he tried to help God because it was taking, the promise was taking long. And sometimes we are guilty of that as well. When it seems in our thinking that God is taking long to do what he has promised, we take the law in our own hands. And we tried to help him out, but God wasn't interested in that. God wanted to do things himself. And when Abraham had reached the end of the road, and God comes and in, because, I mean, they were old, 99 years old. Under normal circumstances, Sarah should not be having a child at that age, or anywhere near that age. But you see, God, this El Shaddai we are dealing with doesn't care about those circumstances. He's God. And he caused Sarah to conceive something which I would say was against the rules of nature. Because even, even Sarah herself had said, look, at this age I don't even have pleasure. But God, for God it doesn't matter. Amen. And so he was, she was given a child. No wonder Philippians 4 verse 19 says, And my God 
shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. This is the God that I believe in. And this is the God that you should believe in. Because when you believe in such a God, and you know who you are believing, nothing will shake you. I know whom I have believed. His name is Jehovah Nisi. He is my victory. He is my banner. With Jesus on, our, on my side, Jesus on our side, Jesus on your side, you are a conqueror. In fact, the Bible says we are not just conquerors. Jesus was a conqueror. But you and I are more than conquerors. Jesus fights our battles. You know, I mean, <laughs> you should look at these chaps. These chaps, the soccer fans. People like Gaza and uh, <laughs> a lot of you, actually. Manchester City, Manchester United, in boxing, Anthony Joshua and all those people. I mean, look at the fans when their team is winning. It's like they are in the pitch. It's like they are the ones who have scored. I mean, <laughs> there are people even collapsed. When an opponent has scored in the last minute, I will never forget there was a fight for promotion. I think it's a few years ago. And uh, there were these directors, were, the cameras were focusing on them. And uh, they were in penalties. And this poor guy was sitting like this. A whole rich director sitting like this, watching the penalties. And as a player, the last player, you know, apparently the other the opponent had missed. And so this was a chance. If that boy scored, then his team is promoted into the Premier League. And he started like this. And as the boy was running, he went like this. <laughs> he didn't want to see what was going on. And when he heard the stadium just burst into excitement, then he knew the boy, the boy had gone into the net. This is how we get affected. They are conquerors. They are the players that are, are, are playing inside. It's the, they are the ones that are, that are hitting each other with fists in the ring. But those of us who are outside are also, <laughs> we are also affected. We won, you know. We are the champions. No, you were not playing. But we are more than conquerors. God fights our battles. In that story of the battle with the Amalekites, for as long as Moses' hands were raised like this, Israel was winning. When he got tired and the hands went down, Israel was losing. And when the disciples, those two big guys, they knew what was going on, one decided to sit on this side, the other one on this side, and they raised his hands. And Israel won the battle. And that showed that it was not their battle. It was not them that were really winning. It is God who won their battle for them. He was fighting their battle. Because without him, they would be vanquished because they were, a very, they were a small army. And trained. People that had been walking through the wilderness. Meeting these Amalekites were very strong. Very organized army. And so he fights our battle. And if you know that God is there to fight your battle, you will not be mocked. Because you say, it's not my battle. There are times, of course, he will say, stand still and see the salvation of God. Yeah, I will stand still. But even if it means I fight, 
And God says, now you fight. Take, out, take up your arms and fight. I will fight because I know that I'm fighting in his name and with his power. I know whom I believed. His name is Jehovah Mikodesh. He's the one that sanctifies me. The Bible says you shall be holy, for I, you, though your Lord, am holy. But we are human beings. How can we be holy? But we can be holy and be set apart because he is our sanctification. He's the one who picks us up. Even with our weaknesses. And he puts us in a place where we can come into his presence. We are holy because he has put that holiness in us. In Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 8 says, I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Without him we cannot be holy. Without him, even if we set ourselves apart, it will not work. We need him to separate us and to make us holy, to be set apart for his ministry, to be set apart for his use. Amen. Amen. I know whom I have believed. His name is Jehovah Sidiken. He is my righteousness. You see, you need to understand that all our righteousness, all our goodness is as filthy rags in his sight. If we are to stand justified, if we are to stand righteous before God, we need to stand in his righteousness, the righteousness that has been imputed in us. You know, for, for some of us, we can give testimonies in church I say, this is how bad I was. I mean, I used to take drugs. I used to do all that. I used to drink heavily and, and all that. And Jesus found me. He rescued me. And now I'm free. I'm saved. But there are those of you like me. I was never a bad boy. I mean, I, even, even, even at home, I was, I was the favorite in the family. Because, I mean, I was good. Uh, up to now, my sister, you know, she protests. She says, my grandmother was so bad. The bias was so open. <laughs> I mean, everybody would get one piece of meat. I would get two. You know, in those days, in the village, we didn't have spoons. And people would go out and use mango leaves and, and to eat your porridge. <laughs> the people here don't understand that. <laughs> We use mango leaves to eat porridge. But there was a, those snail covers, and they, they, were, they used to be special because they were spoons. So while everybody was using leaves, I, was, I, would, give, I would be given that one. I was a favorite grandson, you know. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> You know, it's, there are some things that sometimes we take things for granted. Eh? We take things for granted. The Bible here says, you know, he, we, Jesus who knew no sin became sin for us. Sin for us, even, that, even for us who were good boys. Because I can tell you, for me to get saved, it was harder than, the one, than a drug addict. Because, I mean, I was righteous. That's what I thought, at least. I was clean. I was never playing with, with women. I, I was not stealing. Well, apart from sometimes I would pay, get a bit of sugar. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, put a bit of sugar in my palm and start eating. It was popular in those days. 
But you see, it was hard for me to get saved. But it took God, by his Holy Spirit, to convict me. That despite all this, this, this goodness, all this righteousness, everything was like, it, it was filthy rags. God was my righteousness. Jesus was my righteousness. The Bible says, you know, he took our sin. In fact, it is, he became sin. Not that he sinned. He became sin that you and I might be the righteousness of God. He paid. He paid a debt that did not owe. You and I owed that debt. He paid it. And we had a debt which we could not pay. He paid it for me. He paid it all. And when you understand that, then you begin to say to yourself, yes, truly, there's no condemnation now to them that are in Christ Jesus. Nothing that Satan will lay against me will stand because I have been forgiven. He can't be reminding me of the past. He can't keep saying, Look, remember what you did. Remember what you did. Remember what you've been doing. Because the God, Satan is a specialist in doing that. There's a story of a, a young fellow working in a, in a restaurant back in the kitchen. And one day he stole a chicken. Maybe some of you will understand or know the story already. He stole a chicken. And the supervisor saw him. And he used that to keep blackmailing the boy to do what he wanted. Whenever the black boy would, or the boy would refuse to, to do what he wanted, he would say, remember the chicken? Oh, so he would obey. Again, after some time, remember the chicken? I do finally the boy said, no, 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 I think I better correct this. He went to, to his boss and says, you know, on such, such a day, a chicken went missing. I'm the one who stole it. And I'm sorry. And the boss says, okay, that's fine now. So when this supervisor came next time, say, remember the chicken? He says, yes, I do. But you can tell the boss now because he knows. I'm clean. I've confessed my sin. And now I am forgiven. And you and I, when we come to Christ, when we, we, we confess our sins, he forgives us our sins. We are no longer under any condemnation. And when you believe that, nothing will shake you. No condemnation at all for those that have believed in him. And so I believe, I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Maybe things are not going right in my life. Things have just, they just don't seem to be adding up. I know whom I believed. That keeps me strong. My finances may not be good. I may be struggling in life. But I know whom I have believed. My children may be going astray, but I know <coughs> whom I have believed. Every situation that comes my way, I know whom I have believed. Amen. I copied this from Pastor Will. Uh, he drinks water, it seems to help him. So I believe it has helped me too. I believe. Hallelujah. <laughs> so brethren, I just wanted to encourage you this morning. Know your God. And you'll be strong. Know your God and you'll do exploits. Know your God and believe in him. And nothing 
will shake you. It's not that you will not feel discouraged along the way. You will. I mean, if even people like, like Jeremiah, <laughs> they did. After, after a big, a big uh, uh, win or so, so to speak, a victory, he was hiding in the bush. Not because there was a great army after him. No, the woman had said, I'll kill you. <laughs> it's like he was saying, just, just kill me, Lord. <laughs> it's the end for me. I mean, this guy had just slaughtered the prophets <laughs> on Mount Carmel. <laughs> but he's so scared now. So, even for people like him, he was just man. What more like you and I? You know, who we'll go through the same things, who we'll go through discouragements, who we'll go through storms, who we'll go through challenges, and who we'll go through this feeling that God does not care for me, who we'll go through this temptation to believe that it does, maybe it doesn't even exist after all. But I want you to understand that when you know him and you have experienced his power, you have experienced his love, you experienced his mercy, nothing will shake you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Can you rise with me, please? There are times, you know, the worship team come. Uh, there are times as preachers, sometimes you prepare and you have all your notes very well, neatly done, and you say, I'll say this and that and that. But then we come here and we pray. We say, God, let only that which comes from you. Let me preach only that which comes from you. And at the end you say, but I didn't say that. And you look through the minutes. Oh, I didn't say that. I should have said that. But remember you prayed. Only that which comes from you, God. <laughs> you know, and I mean, there are a lot of things I would have loved to say. Time is not with us, and I, as I've said, if we want to look at who God is and his names, it will take us months for us to fully understand. But all I wanted us to understand this morning that we need to know whom we have believed. So I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him again as that day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we can come to a God like you, a mighty God, creator of the universe, the great I am, the covenant-keeping God and the one who is our supplier, the one who supplies to us, the one who sustains us, the one who nourishes us, the one who satisfies us. We thank you that you are the one who sets us apart. We thank you also, God, that you are our righteousness, and so we can stand complete and worship you. Without that righteousness, we would not be able to lift our hands, our holy hands. Our hands are holy because you have made us holy. Our hands are holy because you have made us righteous. And so we want to thank you. I just want to express our gratitude to you this, this morning. Be glorified, our God. Help us to know you. And reveal yourself to each one of us, O oh God, at our point of need. Reveal, O oh God, who you are to us. And I pray that you, you strengthen us. You always our victory and our banner. You will help us to believe in you. In Jesus' name, amen.